Great to see your faces. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Milian Trulov. I'm the Vice President, Dean of Admission. I'm the guy that signed your admission letters. Uh, so it's really nice to have you here. Uh, and uh, this is our uh, Crest Roundtable. And um, I'm just going to start off uh, just telling you how this is going to run logistically today. Um, because of uh, online technology, we have you mute, muted up front. Hi, person next to Anna. I see you over there peeking in. It's good to see you. <laughs> and you're more than welcome, so I'm glad you've joined. Um, so I'm going to uh, invite you all to ask me your questions via private chat. So once this is done and get started, I'll send you a message and say, hey, this is me. Send me your questions via private chat. I will pass those on to the faculty or I'll tell them what the questions are. And I'm going to collect them the whole time, so don't wait to ask. You can even ask before you know what's going to be discussed. Um, and I'll either group them together, I'll hand them over, or I'll speak them out loud. And that's a way that we'll get full coverage. And don't be shy. Plenty, plenty of questions are, are really great. Um, but we're going to start off by me turning it over to the faculty. I'm going to have each of them introduce themselves and start off by talking a little bit about the department. I can start really quick. Um, my name is Corinne Stoffel and I teach French language and French literature. And I'm also, um, the type of content that I teach is affiliated to CRESS and its mission. Um, great, I can jump in. Hi, um, my name is Victoria Fortuna. My preferred pronouns are she and her. And I teach in the dance department here at Reed. Um, and there's a, there's a, a CRESS dance major, right? So there's it's an interdisciplinary major and we can talk a bit more about that but um my own teaching crosses theory and practice as a dancer i'm trained in modern and contemporary dance and as a researcher i work on um, concert dance practices in latin america and specifically argentina yeah hi everyone my name is lishandra sullivan uh, i'm in the uh, faculty and anthropology department and i uh, teach uh, classes um, among the classes that I teach, uh, I teach classes in CREST, including the uh, CREST Junior Seminar this year, uh, which I will talk ab uh, about in a little bit. Uh, my research focuses on Brazil, um, race and ethnic uh, social movements in Brazil, land conflict, environmental politics, and the like. So, yeah. So, Lauren, can you begin by telling us a little bit about the CREST major, what, what's involved, and how students uh, actually determine that um, they're going to move forward with CRESS at Reed? Yeah, yeah, I'd be delighted to. So the CRESS program is a, an interdisciplinary program uh, and there are, um, it's composed of different departments. So, you know, CRESS itself is not a, formally a department, but it's composed of different, of six different departments. Um, the departments are anthropology, my, which is my department, dance, which is Victoria's, um, history, music, sociology, uh, and theater. And so you would major in, as a CREST major, you would major in, as a CREST major in one of those departments, and you'd go through the curriculum of those departments with some, some differences, which I'll get into in a, in a, in a, in a little bit. Um, but in, in terms of course offerings in CREST, uh, the, there are offerings from across the college, right? Including, for example, the French department where uh, Corinne teaches. And so you would take courses and there are CREST de de designated courses across the college that would be a part of your, 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 your curriculum. And so um, the, uh, CREST is one of the newer programs at Reed. Uh, it's a program, but it's a program that has been in the works for decades, really. And it's something that there is the, the majors in which you can, the departments which, with which you can major aren't completely representative or reflective of the range of scholars, the range of classes, the range of, 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 of speakers and programs and the like that are CREST related or what could contribute to a, a CREST course of study. Um, so, I think that's important to say. Um, like, for example, we have a speaker series um, called the Crest Colloquium that is attended by people from across the college and in which you have presentations by faculty 
from across the college, from the English department, for example. And so um, I can, if you are interested in learning more about the Crest Colloquium, which meets roughly sort of monthly, we have a lunch, you get together with other faculty and colleagues from across the college. Um, I could talk a little bit more about that um, uh, a little bit later. But with, you would major, as a Crest major, you would major within your department of study, whether it be anthropology or uh, dance, and you would um, do a, a junior qualifying exam within those departments and write a thesis within those departments. Um, so that's something to sort of keep in mind um, with you know the kind of particularities of what uh, majoring in Crest would, would look like. So I have a question um, for, for the faculty. Um, the Crest um, faculty are in many different departments for Crest. How does that really benefit a program in particular uh, at a school that really focuses on the liberal arts, this idea that students learn from many areas uh, to, to uh, develop proficiencies? Um, why is it a, a benefit for Crest to be um, interdisciplinary? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm sure uh, Victoria and Corrine can well, uh, speak to this. So I'll just speak very, very briefly. Um, you know, even I think that the, the, the importance of or the merits of thinking in, in terms of an interdisciplinary study is that it gives you a base within which to understand a, a given focal point of study, a broader base within which to understand a given focal point. Um, and I think there's a, a tremendous value in being able to, to draw from the work that's being done in, across different specializations to, to understand a, a given focal point of research or inquiry. Um, and so I, I think there's something inherently valuable for that reason to thinking and working into interdisciplinary, uh, in an interdisciplinary manner. Yeah, no, I think um, just to kind of echo everything that, that Sullivan said, and then I would also add, I think, you know, one of the real benefits of a read education that I'm sure you've probably heard of already is that you get to develop very close relationships with faculty, right? So in the sense of both access to faculty through office hours and close advising relationships, but also over the course of the major, it's likely, and this will vary depending on the department because different departments are different sizes, of course, but we'll often take, in many cases, multiple classes with one professor. So another benefit that I see to an interdisciplinary major like Crest, where you have a home department, but you're also taking classes more broadly beyond it, is it just extends that network of relationships that students have across the college with faculty. Right. So in addition to the kind of theoretical and methodological breadth that the major allows, it's just also allowing you to kind of have a broader network that cross um, the divisional structure. So the college is organized into divisions that are grouped um, loosely around kind of sciences, social sciences, humanities, um, arts. Um, and rather than kind of being in a major where you would stay within the division, you're crossing the division in ways that are um, that are maybe unique to a program like this. I want to add maybe one last thing about this, but just echoing what the mission of CRESS is or what even the value of it is, which is starting to think in uh, uh, starting to think about these issues as multiple and not essential or singular. I think, you know, the fact that specifically this is a multidisciplinary major really speaks to that, to this understanding that is expansive and that is, um, that is definitely speaking to a multiplicity. Um, what I really do like about specifically the size of these classes or the size of the college is that you can, um, we as faculty have the possibility of de developing this, um, this close intellectual relationships, but at the same time, you can also easily reach out to us, you know where to find us. And I, I really like that about, uh, about the college and also this program specifically. Um, so I just saw a question arrive in my chat box. Should I <laughs> should I answer that or, or are we? That sounds great. Absolutely. I don't want to jump the order <laughs> of the format here. But um, okay, so question just arrives. Um, is what kind of student benefits from the Crest program? So um, I would be interested in what others have to say about this, but kind of speaking maybe from the art side of things. So thinking about both theater and dance students that are drawn to Crest um, is students who students who come to read interested in the performing arts um, are coming um, really kind of hungry for the ways that a performing arts education is not going to be based solely 
um, in kind of technical training the way it would be at a conservatory, right? It may be a BFA granting conservatory um, where the training is very rigorous, um, but perhaps a little bit more narrow, right? And what the skill set is that students are building and preparing to come out with. Um, so I think for any performing arts major at Reed, thinking about the arts as a as a liberal art, right, as um, a mode of inquiry that's going to involve thinking about history, culture, politics, and theory at the same time that you're learning the craft is already um, compelling. And then for students who are specifically interested, right, and kind of like aware and embodied level how the performing arts bring issues of race and ethnicity to the fore. I mean, when you have a body on stage, right, you're already thinking and talking about um, the kind of materiality of those sorts of identities and how they get fleshed out in real time and space and performance. Um, it becomes a connection that where it might feel we're thinking about critical race and ethnicity studies in relationship to dance, if you're thinking about it from a conservatory framework, might feel kind of a stretch, right? But in the context of the major and certainly in the context of a liberal arts education, um, those, you know, in many ways, right, dance offers us incredibly rich opportunities for thinking about those questions. Um, Hopefully I answered that question. Excellent. Right, Salon, I think you might have a question. And you're on mute right now. So here, let me unmute you. There you go. Um, actually, you're still on mute. There Hello. Now. Okay. <laughs> now you're great. Okay. Um, yeah, a really good question. What are examples of some of the classes? What's the most common major students combined with CRESS? Um, so some of the, it, I'm not sure about the second question in terms of the most common major uh, students combined with CRESS. And we have, I think currently, we just launched a program. We have a, a CRESS sociology major and a CRESS anthropology major currently. Um, although, um, in terms of our course offerings, there is, um, there's quite a range of courses uh, within the sociology department and also the anthropology department. I'll give you, I'll throw out some of them. I, um, I am currently teaching the CRESS junior seminar course. Um, and so I can, I'll talk a little bit about that course, which is going wonderfully. Um, I'm just, I'm really enjoying teaching it and having a great time uh, with the students. Um, it's of course called Race and Modernity. And I'll just speak very, very briefly about it in a second and talk about the junior, um, the junior seminar um, for, which is the one class that all CREST majors would take together. Um, and so, um, yeah, but like, I'll give you throw out some examples of some of the courses that we uh, are, that are CREST designated now um, in dance, there's Dancing Latinx America. Um, in sociology, the sociology of Asian America, a sociology of race and racism. In history, there's uh, a course called Race, Politics, and Decolonization. And um, yeah, the, so there's, a, there's quite a range uh, of courses. Next year, I'm teaching a course, uh, two cross designated courses. Uh, one is called Black Queer Diaspora, and the other is uh, on race in Brazil, race and ethnicity in Brazil. So. Um, so quite a range. My, my junior seminar course is actually cross-listed with anthropology. And um, there's about 10 students total. So we're, it's a nice uh, size as far as having class discussion. And what we basically do um, is we, we're reading the sort of the, some canonical works from Western philosophy and uh, critiques uh, of the work that the concepts, concept of race is doing in these works. Um, that you would not necessarily read these works for in an, another class of philosophy, the typical philosophy class. So it's an opportunity to dig into um, some, some of the um, sort of taken for granted standard bearers of Western philosophy, but to, all, and to read them with works from the same authors, Western philosophers that are also on race that you wouldn't read with some of their more commonly taught or commonly referenced texts to, to, to understand how conceptions of race are quite central to concepts of ethics, 
of epistemology or understanding and 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 and, and so and ontology and so on and so forth. Um, so the junior seminar for the course where it's offered every year for Crest uh, majors or is open to non-Crest majors as well. But this seminar will change next year. So there's actually, a, it's actually rotated uh, between sociology faculty and other and anthropology faculty and other faculty who, um, um, and so you, you would, would, if you majored in Crest, you wouldn't necessarily take my race and modernity course but you would take a course like it that's essentially focused on race um, that's, that's taught by another, another professor, so. Can I take your course? I don't know. I, I mean, would, I would <laughs> absolutely love it. I would love it awesome. <laughs> But I, I don't know if there's a way we, you can come and sit in my French course and then <laughs> because, and same thing, Victoria, like, I, I don't know. I feel, I feel sad almost to be already on the professor's side so that I can just come and sign up for your classes. That, that's what I, I wanted feeling, to say. I have that feeling regularly. Victoria presented, um, did a presentation on uh, a book in our Crest Colloquium uh, a few months ago, and I had the exact same feeling. I enjoyed the presentation so much and the discussion from it so much. It was like a you know a seminar, except you know we had you know lunch and it was you know <laughs> formal. And but it was great. It it did feel it did, did have that feeling and left me kind of wanting wanting more honestly. So that's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that that's what's so exciting about an interdisciplinary program like this is that you really get the opportunity to kind of have those moments of excitement. Not that we don't feel those in our home departments or in our home majors, but um, the ability for kind of both students and then faculty alike to kind of feel get feel the excitement, right? Of feeling at the edges of like what's your immediate comfort zone is is still really exciting to me, and I really value that you know my colleagues in Crest allow me to experience that. So you know, seeing that mirrored on both kind of the student and faculty level. Um, I do have another question, but Corinne, do you have a question? No, and no one's asking me questions. Okay, okay, I will. Um, you, I, I have one on hold though, for you, so you're next. For, for, okay, <laughs> but maybe Corinne, you could help me out with this question. So, um, how can I do CRAS with any foreign language? So, my understanding. So, currently, mm. the existing interdisciplinary majors right, that we Victoria, have. That, that was supposed to be for Corinne. That's my okay. There we call. go. Take it away, Corinne. <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> I was like, that was for Victoria. I feel so hurt. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, here at Reed, there's a variety of languages um, that, that are taught, obviously. But what I appreciate, for example, for me teaching in the French department is that I believe that um, French is a certain way that people look at it or imagine it, and it's seldom the type of French that I teach or the type of French literature that I teach. So um, the French department uh, offers a variety of uh, geographical, uh, the way that the, um, where the literature is from. But I think that, and I will not be offended if anyone says this, but when you think of French literature, you probably think of France, right? Um, but <laughs> the truth is French is spoken in, uh, uh, in over a hundred countries, for what reason? Colonialism, of course. Um, but uh, uh, what that does is that I think read really values uh, languages and the way that they can be taught, not from this continental perspective. And so, me specifically, the way this works in, in, uh, in, in the courses I teach is that I don't teach courses from, uh, uh, of literature that is from um, continental France. So I teach literature from the French Caribbean and literature from Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, via these literatures, what we learn about is not just the language, of course, not just the poetry, but we are learning a culture. It's all of this is highly implicated in history, understanding of race, racial formations. And so more specifically for me, but this is also true for um, the Department of Spanish or Complete or um, the Chinese department, uh, the, uh, the German department, all of them have a component um, that relates to race or racial formation in various uh, historical formations. And so, um, I think one of the things that's, that is wonderful about READ and these various uh, language departments is the way that they 
always value perspectives that are not the continental or you know not the ones that you expect specifically i hope i answered that now victoria i think you have a question <laughs> actually you know what i before you before you answer that, I, I'm going to jump in with a question of, 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 of all of our faculty members because I've been wondering this for a while. So I think sometimes um, we read something that's so profound, it, it blows our mind and helps us think about the world in a different way. Uh, for me, I think anything by uh, Dr. Uh, Joy DeGruy Leary has done that for me. If you folks have got some time right now outside of their schoolwork, if you were to really suggest a book that folks would both enjoy and would have a sort of a profound impact on the way they view the world, uh, what would it be? What, what reading book list advice would you give them? This might be... Anna looks nervous. <laughs> <laughs> this might be a little too obvious because it just happened, but uh, so you want to talk about race? uh was actually incredibly enlightening and we were so lucky that Ijoma Olumuk was able to come and speak here uh at Frida. So I think that was a book that was really interesting. It's not yeah. So you want to talk about race. That that's mine. That's great, great. Give give uh just two sentences for folks who don't know what it's about. Oh yes. Uh I'm sorry. I'm gonna do the show and tell. I'll be right back. Okay. <laughs> Now this is where it gets really interesting. Raise your hand if you if you've heard of the book. Okay, Sawyer, nice. There we go. All right. So this text actually, uh, and again, uh, Ijoma Oluwa was able to come and talk here to speak at Reed, and it was such a well attended event. But basically, this is a a book that uh, that addresses the way that us collectively as a society can truly engage in uh, um, a discourse on race or a conversation on race that could be healing and that could be productive and that could really get at the root of systemic racism. Um, it's not just yelling at, uh, at people, as she put it. She says, you know, she calls herself a yeller uh, and she thinks that's her job, but there's compassion in the way that she speaks about um, the struggle that America as a country has to address this in a, in a way that can move us forward. So I liked it. It was a very approachable book. That's my take. It's on my coffee table. Good suggestion. <laughs> yeah, um, so I, I'm going to recommend a lecture, actually. Mm. Um, the, the 2019 Holbrook Prize lecture um, the, uh, that Paul Gilroy gave. And you can find it on YouTube. And then maybe there's a way to share a link to, to watch the lecture. Um, but Paul Gilroy, who's a, he does sort of cultural studies, um, and he gave a lecture titled Never Again, um, colon, Refusing Race and Salvaging the Human. And in it, he is talking about the concept of what it is to be a human and humanity and the ways that racialized or sort of thinking um, can translate into certain forms of nationalism, which uh, can be quite problematic when it comes to um, prioritizing our own humanity and our regard for our, or for, for our fellow humans. And um, he uses this metaphor of being at sea and the notion of the sea and crossings uh, of water that ha are, have been a part of the making of the modern world. You think about colonialism as was, was, was referenced. And, um, but, not, but, but in addition to and along with colonialism, this, the sort of the rise of trade or global trade and this sort of notion of being at sea. Um, and, the ways that race and nationalism in very pernicious ways have been a part of the sort of undermining of our sense of a shared humanity and across water um, and the sort of possibilities for kind of re, 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 what he called refusing race and recapturing a sense of this sort of shared humanity and sort of reaching out to, to help people onto the shore, you know, people who are arriving or who may be at lost at sea or in some ways, um, so, um, uh, 
sort of in need of sort of being brought to shore. And I think that's something to be reminded of um, in the politics that we are sort of having to navigate now. Um, and, and I think that, that, that I think it's, it's important to sort of in, sort of in the, the disparities that we're facing and trying to overcome. Um, it's important to it might be might be nice to uh, to listen to uh, this lecture and timely to listen to this lecture now. Um, great, yeah, and I maybe have um, two kind of brief thoughts, maybe one that's a text and one that's a dance, but, um, you know, like so many things, um, the main um, dance presenters here in Portland, um, is called, it's called Whitebird, and they, of course, had to suspend the remainder of their season, but um, earlier this month, just about a week ago, um, <clears throat> Camille Brown and Dancers, um, which is an incredible company, um, and her work um, just sort of really deftly deals with questions around race and specifically how we think about race in relationship to different dance forms, whether they be concert forms, which means like ballet, modern and contemporary forms that we think of as social or vernacular, right? So forms that rise out of communities and other sorts of gathering spaces, but aren't necessarily trained in studios or typically seen on concert stages. Um, her work is really interested in the relationship between mixing those forms um, and, and identity, and specifically race. So um, one of the good things that's come out of this moment is lots of um, online streaming services are making lots of evening length works available. So I was just trying to quickly Google because I'm pretty sure um, her most recent work, um, which is called Black Girl Linguistic Play, um, is available in its full form somewhere. I'll try to find that and maybe get it to you all if you're interested. <laughs> um, so that's a dance, not necessarily a book, but then a book and maybe this points to kind of some of that cross-disciplinary um, viewing and reading that we want to celebrate in Cress. But um, a book I've been reading, it's an interesting read, um, called The Hundreds by um, Lauren Vermont and Kathleen Stewart, Kathleen Stewart, who's an anthropologist. And it's um, these, let me make sure I get this right. They basically did this experiment, um, writing within a 100 word word constraint, right? So each piece is, is multiples of 100, right? So they had like a formal constraint on how they wrote um, the entries in this book. So it's a collection of these kind of fragments. Um, but what those fragments really are about in most cases is just mundane kind of snapshots of everyday life, right? And if we have anything right now, we have the opportunity to pay attention <laughs> to what might feel like the very, very mundane. <laughs> um, and, you know, what's interesting to me about that is in the way they're trying to write the everyday and things that might seem very much not exceptional, they're trying to capture how um, race and gender and sexuality and ability materialize in these very kind of quotidian, meaning day-to-day -day things that we do, whether it's somebody that you know, we see walking by on the street or something that happens on the news as we're making coffee, right? So that book has been weirdly um, resonant for me at this moment in time. Good choices. Wow. I like it. Um, thank you for, thank you for sharing that. I, I have what is um, a complicated question only in that it's long and I want to make sure that we can connect several parts of this. And I might have one or two faculty members um, speak to this because we have a couple of others after this. But um, in regards to diversity on campus, uh, how does the Crest major interact with the student body in discussions and other forms of learning? Um, and then how does the department bridge the gap uh, between discussing race in academia and also in uh, daily interactions? Could you read that first one again? I sure idea? can. Um, how does the Crest major interact with the interact with student body discussions and other forms of learning? So I guess uh, in some ways, students who take Crest, it's an academic study about race and religion, and um, perhaps the way in which folks engage diversity, and then of course in students' social life and social experience on the campus, they have daily interactions that in which uh, race is taken into consideration or people may respond to race and culture. And so how do you, does the academic study of, um, of, um, of Crest intersect with students' lives? Are things that are happening 
among the student body. That's how I interpret that. And Iris, if I didn't capture that, let me know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, f in terms of like the f formal settings of the, for the Crest that the Crest program um, creates or part of the Crest program, part of our colloquium series is, you know, we have um, what we call sort of Crest classics, where we talk about classic texts within our various uh, disciplines and we present and we, uh, we might circulate some text in advance and we get together and talk about those. But we also have a, a part of the series that uh, we have um, sort of called Crest Now, where we talk about contemporary uh, events or you know, someone from a, a relevant specialization or field would talk about things that are happening in the world um, sort of current events or current topics. And one of those, for example, is um, uh, what's going on in Kashmir in India um, and sort of recent uh, events around that. And we would get together, uh, we got together in the colloquium series and, you know, had lunch and kind of and, and learned about what was going on uh, there and talked about that. And that's a part of sort of bigger conversations about race in the contemporary world and things that students are sort of thinking about and, and um, sort of things that are happening right now in the world outside of um, an academic text per se, um, but informed by sort of a research uh, and, and specialization from a given you know, faculty member. Um, and also, you know, um, students have presented, uh, Crest majors presented, or not Crest majors, but students who are researching Crest for their theses, uh, Crest related topics for their theses, whether they're not, whether or not they're in the Crest department. We, we have used the occasion of the colloquium series to, for students to present their work and to have conversations about that. So the, the kinds of conversations that students are having among themselves about the different things that they're interested in Crestwise, we have to, to provide formal occasions uh, for sort of gathering around those ideas and extending those conversations into, um, into the, the, for the performing the Crest program. As far as and my colleagues, um, I'm, I'm sure we'll, we may have be able to speak to this uh, better than me, but as far as um, the my sense is that these convers these types of conversations are a part of a sort of sh a shared life or intellectual life in amongst the campus community and and contribute to an atmosphere of discussion or open discussion that I would hope would. Um, be uh, become a part of or contribute to a sense of, in which the ways that students are experiencing race um, and, and and querying uh, race and ethnicity in their everyday lives and on campus outside of formal settings would be a part of sort of, of contributing to and hopefully enriching um, um, their experience or at least contributing to their ability to and capacity to be able to talk about uh, what is happening um, more sort of um, in, in terms of their personal uh, in, uh, relations and the, the general atmosphere of the campus. My hope is that that's the case. I don't, of course, I'm, I'm uh, a faculty member here, so I'm not necessarily privy to those things, although that's, you know, definitely something that I would encourage students to, uh, you know, to, to, if you're interested to reach out to uh, fellow, to potentially future fellow re students, sort of get a sense of that. But I, I do think that you know, that the program, and I do hope, and I do believe that the program is a, a part of contributing to um, understanding and discussions about sort of personal experiences of, of race on the campus. I, I wanted to add a little bit to that because I think you're completely right, Salib, and I think that the conversations that are um, happening in CREST courses or CREST-related courses end up being echoed a lot by um, students who are affiliated with the Multicultural Resource Center. Mm. And uh, um, in that center, this is a, um, this is a, a student-led organization, and they end up um, having um, events that are specifically for students. Now, some of those events are par not parties, they are dances, okay? And those happen. I haven't personally attended, you know, because that's not, I'm not invited, but, <laughs> but my students do tell me about them. And so um, you have definitely social events that are um, not just for students of color, but led by students of color that are welcoming of everyone, regardless of race or gender uh, or sexual orientation, but 
what these events do is that it's the time for students to take the type of conversations that we're having in class and see what they do and what kind of conversations they have or they can organize on their own. And so I would say that um, yeah, the MRC or multi Multicultural Resource Center is definitely a space where uh, students have the opportunity to uh, take these conversations and do something that they want with them. Certainly there's the social event, but as I said, it, there's the social or the gathering or the camaraderie uh, aspect of the MRC, but it's also, they're incredibly geared towards social justice. Um, also making academia accessible to students of color or students who are first generation and such. And so um, they, the students that I know that are affiliated with MRC are just, they're absolutely incredible and they're really truly interested in make, making a difference in the way that um, uh, academia is accessible to more people than it's been historically. And it's fun. And I would just add like one just quick final note to add on to those really wonderful um, answers really is, is just to kind of note that, and this is true of Reed and many other programs across the nation, but the Critical Race and Ethnicity Studies program, part of its history of coming to be was activism on the part of students of color advocating for the foundation of the program, right? So thinking about that history, that past, as, you know, a kind of fundamental part of the program's DNA, maybe even say that, <laughs> um, you know, as thinking about, right, so on these ongoing conversations, right, across kind of student-led spaces and then kind of primarily classroom spaces, um, that history is always there. And I think um, on the part of the program, kind of imagining future um, avenues for conversation or kind of maintaining that fluidity um, is critical. So we are almost at time, but I have uh, one final question. I'm going to ask this and um, you all get two or three sentences to, to give us a, your, your best answer. So no, <laughs> no worries. I know you got this. Um, it's really good because it, it goes to what I think is at the heart of, uh, of the CRUST program. Um, oftentimes students come to this major because it's a personal passion uh, and because it has some meaning in their life. And I think, you know, all of us could, could speak to that. Uh, this question is for the CRUST professors. What made you passionate uh, about your subject matter? And why do you teach at Reed? Good question, Sawyer. How many sentences did you say we got? <laughs> <laughs> That's why three is so hard, but... Um, <laughs> okay, someone ask me for me. <laughs> Okay, so in three sentences, why are we passionate about maybe maybe three matter and those. why are you passionate about your subject matter and then why do you teach at Reed? Um, well, I'll, I can answer the, the latter uh, question pretty quickly. I, I teach at Reed primarily because the students are so fabulous, mm -hmm. and I can teach. Um, um, with a certain degree of sort of intensity and high level. And um, my students are always, um, uh, the, both demand that high level of themselves and of me. So there's a sense of sort of mutual, um, sort of deep investment mm -hmm. in uh, sort of being sort of optimizing and maximizing effort and learning. Um, and, and not just on their part, for I, I also get a lot out of it, out of the, the teaching experience and working with the students. And so that's a big part of why I, t I teach at Reed. Um, why am I passionate about the subject matter? Um, I, I learn uh, early on uh, in my education the importance of thinking critically about uh, race and ethnicity and thinking about it across uh, an array of topics, um, not just the humanities and social science, but natural sciences. Um, and, 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 and the, um, the pervasiveness of the, the, the ways that the concept of race and ethnic, concept of race and ethnicity factor into intersection with gender, class, sexuality, 
factors into the, the both everyday life and the way we come to think in sort of general knowledge production sort of raises the raised to me the importance of sort of, of, of studying um, and to sort of being better understanding um, the ways that it, this, it, these concepts work uh, and play out in, uh, across so many different areas. So um, it, it, it has real world stakes and it, it matters in terms of what it is that we see unfolding and that, that is happening in our own lives. And so um, I'm, 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 that's, that's part of my passion for, the, for my work. Thank you. Um, and I would say, just to echo Sullivan, similarly, um, what is what is so wonderful about teaching at Reed is is the students, right? Is students' kind of engagement, students' um, real kind of dedication to knowledge and to learning and to um, sort of like high levels of critical thinking as like the most important thing we should be doing every day. Right? And that's a real that's a real joy. Um, and for me, in terms of what makes me passionate about what I study and what I teach, um, really sort of comes down to, for me, these categories of social difference, right, that we're talking about, you know, having some relationship to each other, right, so race, gender, sexuality, class, stability, um, as categories, right, that are read on and also constructed on bodies, right, as bodies, you know, navigate their way through the world. Um, the, the ability then of a body in motion and dance, whether that's on a street or a stage or a club or wherever that dancing may be, um, every day, right? It brings me a lot of joy <laughs> for, you know, to, to kind of be with students and thinking about the relationship between those two kinds of movement, right? How social identities get constructed through movement in daily life and how they get constructed um, in a wide array of dance practices. Um, I will try to be quick and I'm definitely going to echo what Sullivan and uh, Victoria said. The students uh, are truly uh, just a, a wonderful part of it, but I'm going to add that the faculty as well are, and I don't mean just me. <laughs> I mean that the faculty in the French department where I teach are absolutely wonderful and supportive and creative. The faculty that I know outside of the French department inspire me all the time uh, and definitely present, present uh, company included. And so uh, just to do, oh, and by the way, also staff and also everyone who works outside of uh, the faculty and the students. I cannot express just how grateful I am even for um, the people who right now are keeping our library going in these circumstances, truly incredible. Just, just the way that we are all able to work together, that is absolutely inspiring. Um, and then really quick, um, why I am passionate about um, what I teach, um, it seems a little bit, um, I mean, it is personal. I am French and Caribbean and I am multiracial and I feel that uh, growing up, I didn't actually hear a lot from French um, national discourse. There's not a lot of space for people who are bicultural or who are biracial um, or even who are um, at the cusp of two languages between French, in my case, and and uh, Creole, which is another language um, of where I am from. So I'm, I am from a French Caribbean island. So for me, teaching French from a non-metropolitan, non-continental um, uh, non perspective is, is really personal. I'm trying to sort of like recreate this discourse that I didn't grow up around. Um, but also, as Sullivan said, this is an opportunity for us to really think about what it means to be humans, but also humans in the 21st century with all the connections that are enabled by technology or um, just the possibility of travel or to be in touch with each other in ways that we were never able to do. Um, and I feel that teaching um, French in that manner, or thinking of race through the prism of sort of this French multicultural um, para uh, paradigm is, uh, I think, I don't know, that's, that's fascinating to me. It seems like we're only speaking about French, but we're really speaking about the world and new ways of understanding uh, race and cultures. So that's, that's what's really exciting for me. Oh, that's great. Thank you all for sharing that. Um, I want to thank you all for spending some time with us on a Friday afternoon. And I really want to thank all of the students that joined us today. Uh, it's really fun to see your faces and it's fun to see some folks come back and do multiple sessions with us. 
Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, next week is going to be a pretty exciting week. Um, Audrey Bilger uh, is going to join us for an interview on Sunday. Um, so you'll receive a communication about that and not too, uh, before too long. So you'll get to talk to the president of the college and a lot of other interesting sessions. Some of those are intended to answer some of your parents' questions. Uh, and soon we're going to update our website yet again uh, to respond to some of the questions you're wondering uh, about any anxieties you might have about the fall, might have about the fall and how to approach it. Uh, one thing I'll just share with you, and I've shared this a few times, so I apologize if, you, if you've all heard it before. Um, some of you are in the throes of making a really important decision. And one thing I've always said is it's really easy to think about the next year, either because you're really excited about who your roommate is going to be or where you're going to live or the idea of living independently. Uh, or it might be because you have a bit of anxiety about an unknown future. But I want you all to, I want to invite you all to think about your senior year. Uh, and your, that's your senior year of college. Um, based on all the information you have from these different places, I think you actually have enough data to determine based on uh, an experience at Reed or another school, uh, what type of human you would be your senior year. And you're, the senior version of you um, at Reed might look a little bit different than the senior version of you at a different school. And I think the challenge is deciding which of those two versions of you you're most excited about. And so that allows us to lift up our heads and look more towards the horizon and incorporate all of this information in a different way. Um, but I hope that's helpful for you making a decision. Um, next week, we have a lot of um, student roundtables where we're bringing in admitted students, uh, eight of you with a couple of our current students, so you all just get to chat and talk to each other so you don't have to be on mute, uh, along with a score of other events, um, both academic and social. So check those out. Um, again, thanks to our faculty for being here. Uh, really, really nice to have your input, and I will see you all soon. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Good luck. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Bye, thank you.